Um, the last time I was here, I think it was six months into my um, faculty position, and I was asked to give grand rounds, so I sat down one day and spent 12 hours um, writing this lecture on ACLS and the evidence behind how, why we do ACLS. And that really is what prompted a lot of the work that you're going to see today, because I'm going to take you through the last three years and what we've been able to do. So um, we're going to talk a lot about cardiac arrest. I'm going to focus on out-of-hospital cardiac arrest today. I, we do a lot of work in hospital, and many of you, we've been at CODES together or mock CODES together. You're welcome. Uh, but today I'm going to focus mostly on the arrest that happens out in the world. We're going to talk a lot about best practices and the gaps between what we know we should do and what we're actually doing. Um, we're going to also talk about the retention of CPR skill. This is what I spend a lot of my time thinking about. How can we make people retain that skill set? And then I'll tell you about the ongoing efforts that we and others are doing to try and improve this um, CPR skill in the public. So here's the problem. Every year there are 350,000 out-of-hospital cardiac arrests in the United States alone and about just as many in Europe where we also track them. Survival is very poor, somewhere between 11 and 12 percent. That's going up slightly over time, but that's still abysmally poor. There is up to five-fold geographic variation in the rates of survival from cardiac arrest. So if you live in Seattle, you basically can't die from an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. I was uh, in a wedding there, and one of the other bridesmaids came in for, to the wedding and said, oh, you'll never believe what happened. She was getting donuts for all of us, you know, real healthy, all the doctors that were in that wedding. And uh, someone passed out. They were not dead. They had a pulse. But some bystander said, I know what to do, pulled them to the ground, started doing CPR, literally on an alive person. So in Seattle, you can't, you're not allowed to die from cardiac arrest. Um, but in other places, the survival rate is as low as 3%. So there's this huge discrepancy based upon where you live. I see this as an opportunity. So if we are able to increase the survival from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest by just 1% every year, that translates into 3,500 people who go home to spend the holidays with their loved ones. And this is really what drives me. A very small incremental change has a large absolute impact. So in order to improve survival, we need to first find what are the factors that influence survival and which of them can we change. Uh, so I like to lecture interactively as the residents know. Can anyone tell me one characteristic of either the patient or of the arrest itself that might influence survival? Witness versus unwitnessed. Witness unwitnessed. Absolutely. If you're in your bathroom when this happens versus if you're in um, the mall. What else? Having an AED. Okay, good. So if they get defibrillated, absolutely. So early defibrillation, that's why we've done all this work to get those defibrillators into airplanes and out into the public. What about whether or not you need defibrillation? So shockable rhythm versus unshockable rhythm. That's going to give you a huge discrepancy in whether or not you survive. What other factors might you think influence survival here from cardiac arrest? Age, absolutely. So the 24-year-old who has a lot of reserve versus the 84-year-old, absolutely. Anything else? Anyone can I didn't bring candy. I usually throw candy at the residents, but yesterday I lectured on preventive cardiology, so I feel like a hypocrite if I were to bring candy and throw them. So good, you guys got a lot of them. So witness, shockable rhythm. If you actually have return of circulation in the field, you're much more likely to survive. Of course, that makes sense. Public location is important. We talked about that. And then under patient characteristics, we have age, and then not surprisingly, gender and race, as usual, they, they influence survival. I've bolded here the only two factors that we can do anything about. I can't control where you have your arrest and if anyone is with you or not, or what mechanism of arrest you have, but we can impact the time to defibrillation by having AEDs out in public, and I can influence whether or not you get bystander CPR. So these are the two factors that I spend all of my time thinking about and trying to influence. This is an old study, but I like it. It has sophisticated math, but it gives me a really nice uh, tag phrase that I can use when I'm speaking to the public. So this is looking at, retrospectively, looking at people with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and just characterizing the time from collapse to CPR as less than five minutes or a bit more than five minutes. And then the time from collapse to defibrillation, obviously for shockable rhythms, less than 10 or greater than 10 minutes. So if you look down here in the people who had prolonged time to CPR and prolonged time to defibrillation, nobody survives. But on the flip side, if you look at people who get early CPR, and I don't even know if I'd call that early defibrillation, 10 minutes is still a long time, but earlier defibrillation, 
those people have a much higher rate of survival. So through fancy math, the um, authors here came up with this statement. There is a decrease in survival by 8 to 10% for every minute delay after collapse to CPR and defibrillation. So this is what I like to tell people. Every minute delay, 10% decrease in survival. 10 minute delay, 100% decrease in survival. So this is what drives, again, the work that we're doing. So there's another problem on top of this. I've already told you we have a lot of cardiac arrests and nobody survives and I've depressed you. Well, let me tell you another problem. We know that bystander CPR improves survival. That's been shown time and time and time again. Um, but as you might expect, the overall rate of CPR in this country is pretty low at 31%. That's the average across the entire country. And once again, there is a lot of variation in this rate of bystander CPR. And the variation in the rate of bystander CPR exactly correlates with the variation in survival. So we have this very tight relationship between bystander CPR and survival from cardiac arrest. So this is a more recent paper. On the x-axis, you have the, this is a by-county level in the U.S., the rate of bystander CPR, so the percentage of the arrest victims that get CPR. I can tell you, I'll show you this data later, in Jefferson County, we're around 15%, which is very poor. And then on the y-axis is what we really care about, neurologically intact survival. Who cares if your heart is beating and you can even breathe a little bit on your own? We want you to be restored to full function. So as you can see, there's a nice linear relationship. The more that the bystanders are giving CPR, the better your chances of survival. I'll show you the scale. This is still pretty low overall, but there is a tight relationship here. So when we look at the predictors of who actually performs CPR, this is asking people who had performed CPR, what are the factors that, uh, that exist that may have influenced you doing CPR? Being trained in CPR gives you the highest odds ratio of actually performing CPR. I know this seems obvious, but it's nice to have data to show that what I'm doing actually matters. So if we train them, they're much more likely to perform CPR. Okay, great. So now I've given you the introduction to all the grants that I ever write. So again, I see all of this as an opportunity. Bystander CPR, the most modifiable factor influencing survival from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. CPR training is the strongest predictor of performing bystander CPR. So, therefore, A plus B equals C, if I can increase the rate of CPR training, I'm probably going to improve survival from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, the American Heart Association has set a goal for us to increase our rate of bystander CPR in the U.S. from 31% up to 62% by the year 2020. <laughs> We're like two minutes away from that, and it's not going to happen. So there's a lot of work to do, but again, thank you, AHA, because this gives me reasons to write grants and to do the work that I do. Well, does this actually work? Is there, is there any point to putting all this money and advocacy effort into getting people trained in CPR? Well, as usual, the Scandinavians are ahead of us when it comes to resuscitation. This was published in New England Journal, and it's looking at Sweden. So Sweden is a relatively small country, very um, easy to implement large-scale interventions there. So they took, took the opportunity to train their entire country in CPR. And so you can see that over the course of time, um, this in the red line is showing you the number of people trained in CPR, just pure numbers. And then the dashed blue line is showing you the number or percentage of arrest victims who get CPR before the paramedics arrive. And you can see, okay, we train more people, more of the victims are getting CPR. Okay, good. But then down here is what we really care about. So this is looking at the survival rate. And this is looking at the difference between people who get CPR before the paramedics arrive and those who do not. And you can see that there's a, a much higher rate of survival in those who get CPR, obviously, but you also see that that survival rate is going up over time, correlating with when they started doing this training in CPR. So we have evidence in Sweden, Denmark, also some places in Minnesota and North Carolina, that if we train the population, the actual survival rates go up. This is a map looking at the rates of CPR training in the United States, and they're separated by tertiles. So the Places colored in light blue are in the lower end of the scale, dark blue, higher end of the scale. Okay, that's good to know. You know, here we are, and we have some areas in Kentucky that are, have a lot of people trained, usually around cities, others with very poor numbers of training. But what matters here, again, is the scale. Does anyone want to guess what the average percentage of the population that are trained in CPR is in the country? Just throw out a random number that you think. Okay, I'm hearing 10 or 15%. Y'all are so optimistic. 
we're healthcare providers, so of course we think everybody's trained. How can you not be trained in CPR? The median rate of training in the country is 2.4%, and even the highest areas, only 7% of the population is trained in CPR. So this is really abysmal, and we have a lot of way that we can go. The Institute of Medicine published a study in 2015 looking at cardiac arrest in general. And again, this is where I get all of my fuel for the fire when I'm trying to um, get money to do this stuff. So they called for initiatives designed to increase bystander CPR, and they must overcome the barriers and teach the technical skill to perform CPR with confidence. They also called for increased efforts to reach communities and populations where disparities are prevalent. Because I showed you there was that huge geographic variation in survival, there's also the same variation in the rates of CPR. So this prompted myself and many of my fellows to uh, come up with and test a novel CPR training method that I call Alive in Five, because it's a five minute training method. I have to credit my best friend from training came up with this um, slogan, which I think is awesome. So what is Alive in Five? Well, this is what we did at the State Fair. I know some of you are familiar with that work that we did. We wanted to take CPR training and make it as simple and streamlined and effective as possible. So we went to the state fair um, in, uh, I think, 2015 here, and we're just grabbing passersby and having them, hey, do you want to get trained in CPR? Do you want to save a life? You'd be surprised how many people say no. <laughs> <laughs> but I put my most convincing fellows out there in the crowd to grab them, and we get real manipulative, like, oh, do you love your husband? Come learn how to get trained in CPR, because he looks like he's going to know. <laughs> <clears throat> so we're, these people are not necessarily motivated to get trained in CPR. Anyone have ever been to the state fair here? Show of hands. Okay, people are motivated to get free stuff. So we did, in fact, give them some free stuff here, and they stole all of our pens thinking that they were free. But we were getting these people who you know, really didn't have any motivation and trying to train them in CPR. So we've got five minutes at best. We would start with a video that's produced by the AHA that's a two-minute instructional video. It's kind of fun. It has the um, Staying Alive song and shows them the simple components of bystander hands-only CPR. And it's just two things. Call 911, push hard and fast in the center of the chest to the beat of the song, Staying Alive. So that's two minutes. Here I have this column showing you the sensory modality that we're hitting because one of our theories is that we need a multi-sensory training that really encompasses all of your senses because that actually promotes your retention of skill and learning. Then they do the CPR practice with active coaching for two minutes. This is tactile. We used real physiologic mannequins and this device actually measures the rate and the depth of their CPR compressions. And then after they had practiced, we had them do a one minute time CPR round. Uh, originally, I wanted this to be two minutes, but alive in six doesn't really sound as well. Um, also, we found that people couldn't really go for two minutes. The average population is pretty unfit, and so two minutes was a long time. Um, so I want to show you what this kind of looked like in real life. So uh, this is when we were back with Kentucky One. Um, and so here we are kind of giving them a little instructive video. This is my very active coaching that's happening. And we're helping them to stay on beat. We're giving them some pointers and active coaching in real time to correct their technique. You can see she was not as good. Others are really good. <laughs> And then after they completed this time round of CPR, where we were actually measuring the quality of the chest compressions, you can see the device there. They got a little sticker. Um, everyone wanted to know, am I CPR certified now? Definitely not. But at least they got a sticker. So uh, over the course of about um, four hours or so, we were able to train 150 adults and 66 minors. It's really interesting. People would let their kids do it because kids don't have any shame. So they're like, I want to try. And the adults were like, mm -hmm. I'm okay. But we've realized that even if the kids aren't going to learn effective CPR, just getting the, their parents to see it was still worthwhile. So we also trained some minors. It was pretty efficient, 4.6 participants per personnel hour. It's probably more efficient than the classes that we all do. So most importantly, did this work? Did we teach them good CPR? So this is showing you their chest compression rate per minute and then the percentage of the chest co compressions that are at the correct depth. So they hit the target, 100 beats per minute, and we were pretty tight. That's probably because they were hearing us going like this, they had the song in their mind, and there were a bunch of them at the same time, so they kind of had that um, manometer, if you will. The percentage of chest compressions that were at the correct depth, we chose 70% as our cutoff because it turns out that's what healthcare providers do. We get about 70% of the compressions at the correct depth. And you can see that although there was a much wider spread, our participants pretty much hit that mark as well. So in five minutes, we taught them how to do effective, high-quality CPR. 
But we also were testing out whether or not this strategy of going to the state fair successfully targeted people from those areas with low rates of bystander CPR. So we got to do some fun population stuff. This is Jefferson County, and we actually have a registry for our cardiac arrests here in, in the county. And these are, by zip code, the rates of bystander CPR at the time the study was done. So when yellow is below national average, between 0 and 30% of arrests get CPR. In blue is between 31 and 61%, so better than average. And then in orange, if you go to die, please go to 40209, because that's where they have greater than the um, aspirational goal of 62% of arrests get bystander CPR. Low numbers, of course, but this is just showing you kind of the, um, the rates of bystander CPR here. Each red dot is one of our participants at the state fair. So not all of our participants were from Jefferson County, but those who were from Jefferson County about 77% of them came from areas with low rates of bystander CPR. So by us going out into the community, instead of asking them to come to the Red Cross to get trained, we successfully targeted people from those areas where we want to get. This prompted us to do a lot of work. I spent a lot of time teaching CPR and yelling at people. <laughs> so we uh, took this training technique into the lobbies of hospitals across the state to teach people as they were coming in and out to see their loved ones. Of course, we got to go to the basketball games, which was a total thrill because I love a microphone. Uh, and then we also, as Dr. Boley mentioned, went to the state senate and we were teaching some lawmakers here how to do CPR. And through these efforts, we've probably are closer to almost 2,000 people that we've actually trained hands-on over the last many years. And then we've done a lot of media campaigns, so millions of people have now heard the message of bystander CPR. So we're really proud of that work, but now we're trying to move this into bigger scale. Dr. Bully mentioned a little bit about CPR in high schools. So we want to transition out of the public arena and talk about why we're going into high schools and what we're doing there. So over the past many years, there has been this enormous push to get legislation passed to require CPR training in high schools before you graduate. So you can see that this has really taken an upswing, even between 2010, not that long ago, and now. It's like a trend. It's a total fad. So all the states that don't have a law are feeling really left behind. And we're at 38 states right now that have a law requiring CPR training, and it will be 50. There's no doubt. So myself and then um, two of our medical students, um, Carlos Leans and Travis Carroll, decided that we wanted to know, though, what are these laws and really what's happening on the ground level. So it's great that we have all these laws passed, but what is, does it actually matter? Oh, first, let me tell you some numbers. So we have 16 million high school students in the U.S. 82% of them live in states with a CPR law right now, so that's great. But that means, if you do all the numbers, that every year 700,000 students, almost a million, graduate without being trained in CPR. So that's a huge missed opportunity and an easy place for us to get in there and train people. Well, first, let's ask why high schools. Well, they're a captive audience, and pretty much the majority of the country has to go through high school, right? So it's a great area and way to kind of reach everybody in the country. This is important. There's also the potential for repeat exposures. So we can train you once, but I still have, you're still a captive audience because usually we train freshmen. So we have the opportunity to maybe train you again before you leave high school. And I personally think that's really important. So the questions that we set out to answer, and um, this is the work that we were able to publish in the Journal of American College of Cardiology. First of all, we want to know what the laws actually say, right? Because each state has a slight variation. So we wanted to characterize the laws themselves to understand what is the requirement. And then most importantly, figure out what's actually happening at the ground level. How are these laws being implemented in high schools around the country? So first, if we look at the laws themselves, so this is a map of the country. So in gray are the states that are behind with no law. In blue are the states that have a law, and they require that their CPR program be endorsed by a national organization like the AHA or the Red Cross. So that makes sense, right? Interestingly, there are these two states in green that just say CPR, and they don't have any stipulation for what kind of program or that it has to be endorsed or recognized nationally. Then the red dots are on the state capitol in states that also require some version of AED training. Most of the time, that's simply they have to be told about an AED. Very few of them require you to actually get hands-on training. But those states require AED training. Many states, Texas, no mention about the AED whatsoever. And then finally, what I think is really important, the states outlined in red, which there are only very few, require that your instructor be a certified instructor. 
So not that the person has been CPR certified and taken the class and knows how to do CPR, but that they've been trained as an instructor. So very few of the states have that requirement. Basically, anybody can teach CPR. So if we break this down graphically, here's showing you the states where the training method is specified. Again, in blue, has to be nationally recognized. This one, this 3%, um, these are the guys over in Alabama. This is an old law, and they require all their students to get, quote, full certification, which, as you all know, takes about four hours or so. Uh, so that's interesting. They're the only state that requires full certification. And then here, again, what I think is so important to highlight is that um, only 8% of the states require that your instructor be certified to teach CPR. So, okay, that's what the state laws say. What are the schools actually doing? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you this first. We know that there's a huge difference in CPR laws. There's actually at least five different methods that are endorsed by the American Heart or the Red Cross Association. The mannequin to use vary from this low fidelity inflatable pillow to kind of creepy uh, to very high tech. This is uh, the brain highlights when you get good enough CPR to have brain perfusion. And then instructors vary from disinterested. It's one of my medical students. Uh, to very enthusiastic. <laughs> so there's this huge range, right? And so not all CPR training is really the same. So again, that's why we wanted to go to actual high schools and see what they were doing. So I have to credit Carlos, uh, my medical student, who does want to go into cardiology. He did this incredible effort last summer where he was tracking down uh, state superintendents for education and high school principals and just trying to get people to respond to a survey that we sent out electronically. So we were able to get survey respondents shown in yellow dots from a pretty good spread across the country. Some states actually totally refused to send our survey out to their high schools, but many others were uh, Seattle. I told you Washington's real keen on CPR, so they were like, yeah, we want to brag. But we got a pretty good spread across the country from coast to coast. And when we looked at the high schools that participated, so we had just over almost 500 high schools respond to our survey. And most of them were public schools, but they were split about 50-50 between urban and rural areas. So this is a pretty good representation of high schools in general in the U.S. So we think this data can be extrapolated to represent the country. So when we asked them, what are you actually doing? How are you training people in CPR? So about 60% of them use one of the AHA programs. About 60% of them use a non-inflatable mannequin. I think this is really important. Have any of you ever tried CPR on that little pillow inflatable mannequin? Anyone done that? Okay, it sucks. It really doesn't feel at all like a real human chest. And so although it's cheap, those mannequins cost about $40. The more physiologic mannequins cost anywhere from $250 to $400 each. But they are much more realistic for the chest. So I think this is really important when we're developing motor memory, uh, motor skills. Again, about 60% of them do teach some form of AED training. And then I asked them only if their instructor was actually CPR certified, not even whether their instructor was certified to teach CPR. This is a little horrifying, right? Some people that aren't even certified in CPR are teaching the high schoolers how to do CPR. Not that it's a really complicated skill, but you do need to know something about it in order to teach it. So that's what was actually happening with boots on the ground. So if we take a look at this, what I conclude is that there is some variability in the laws, despite these very simple recommendations from the AHA. So AHA says your law should teach people to recognize the need to start CPR. It should teach hands-on CPR. You should actually practice. And then it should teach something about the use of a defibrillator. Those are the only three recommendations from the AHA. So that's fine, but I don't think that's appropriate or the gold standard. If we're going to make a law and we're going to make a CPR program, that program should be endorsed by experts. That program should definitely teach hands-on CPR. I also think that program should teach you how to use an AED because remember that our only two modifiable factors are early defibrillation and high-quality CPR. So why not teach all of those things? So if I apply that standard for what a program should be, only 23% of the schools in my survey would meet that standard. And if I extrapolate that out to the country, that means that over a million students are receiving substandard training each year. Combine that with the million who are graduating who didn't receive CPR, and we're missing the chance to train 2 million rescuers every year. So again, this is why I spend all of my time doing this. 
So another question, actually, Dr. Bully asked me this at one of our recruitment dinners the other night. Does this actually work? We're putting tons of money and effort and time. We're taking away one of their health classes from learning about hepatitis or something. And we're, that's really important. No offense. <laughs> But we, but we are taking time away from it, right? And actually, I've had um, educators, talk, when I've been talking to them on the phone about wanting to do some studies in schools, be very concerned that I would take an entire class period to teach CPR because that meant that there was something else they'd have to sacrifice in the curriculum. So we spend a lot of time and money and effort on this. Does it actually work? Um, so these are my wonderful medical students that we got to do, have a lot of fun going and doing some research um, a couple of springs ago. Um, I work with a foundation in town called Start the Heart, which is a nonprofit started by one of our colleagues over at Baptist, Bill Dillon. He's an interventional cardiologist who got sick and tired of having dead people come onto his cath lab table over and over again because he didn't get bystander CPR. And all of us in the room who take care of these patients feel the same way. It's really, really discouraging when you have a 24-year-old kid who dropped dead at the dinner table and no one did CPR on him. That happened just a few weeks ago. So Bill started this organization before we had a law to require CPR training in Kentucky and just said, fine, we'll do it. We'll train everybody. And through Start the Heart, we've trained over 30,000 people in just a few years. So they go into high schools and they train them in CPR. So I went back into those same high schools in the spring to test the skill retention for students who are being trained in pretty much the usual manner that most high schoolers in this country are being trained on. And I took the students with me. I had just taught their second year class, so they all felt pretty beholden to me, which was kind of awesome. <laughs> you know. And we had a lot of fun. In fact, some of them were um, saying they were going to do Yelp reviews of all the cafeterias of the high schools we went to. Um, and, and we were in the gyms. We played basketball with the students afterwards. It was just really a wonderful time. So we took real mannequins, physiologic mannequins, and our CPR recording devices. As a little aside, just for all of the um, people in the audience who want to do research, I had no budget for this at all. So I somehow managed to buy one of these devices. It cost around $900. And then I got the rep to let me borrow four other ones for the sake of the research and then gave them back to him afterwards. These we borrowed from the Sim Centers, free labor. And, uh, <laughs> and then we wanted, I bought them all lunch. I didn't buy them lunch. So we went into the high schools and we checked the CPR skill retention. Now, a few important things. These students were trained on those pillow mannequins that I showed you before, the inflatable ones, because that's what's affordable. And we went in and we tested them on these mannequins. And we tested them. Some schools had been trained three months prior, and some schools had been trained six months prior. I'm just going to show you the six-month data because <laughs> that's longer than three months, but it's pretty much identical to the three-month data. So this is looking at the percentage of individuals who achieve the recommended rate. I put it that way because if I just show you the average chest compression rate, that's of course going to be right around 100 because most of them are going to get there. I think what really matters is whether we're how, what percentage of the people I train are trained well. So this is actually a new metric that I'm proposing that we use to evaluate CPR training methods. So what percentage of them do appropriate chest compressions? So shaded in gray are the people who are between 100 and 120 beats per minute, and that's only a total of 30% of the students did chest compressions at appropriate rate six months after they were trained. Then if we look, this is really interesting. These are the percentage of chest compressions at the appropriate depth. Now remember, these students were trained on those pillow mannequins, which don't, they, they click when you hit appropriate depth, but they feel nothing like a real chest. And now I bring in these physiologic mannequins. So shaded in gray are those who achieve 70% or greater of the chest compressions at appropriate depth. So kind of meeting that metric for healthcare providers. And again, this is around 30% total. What's interesting here is it's bimodal distribution. Either you got it right, or you're totally terrible at CPR, right? <laughs> We have a lot of hypotheses that were generated because of this study. For example, are these the tiny freshman girls and these are the bigger guys? Uh, are these the people who care because they have a grandparent with heart disease or they're Boy Scouts or they're overachievers? <laughs> we don't know what makes a difference between these two things. Or are these the people who were asleep because these are the morning classes and these are the afternoon classes? We did see a real big difference as the day went along about how engaged the students were. So we have generated a lot of hypotheses about what leads to skill retention, and that's one of the things that we want to study. Because right now we're just shotgun approach teaching everyone in the country. But if we can identify those who are actually going to retain the skill set, maybe we just train those people and tell the rest of the people, uh, no thanks, but I don't want you on my CPR team. 
All right, so over the past many years, we have had a lot of research and study that tells us what to do, what are best practices when it comes to cardiac arrest. So we've learned about bystander CPR, hands-only CPR, which was totally revolutionary, hypothermia, which we do in the CCU, but has nothing to do with what happens out in the world, public access defibrillation, and then CPR laws. So we've done a lot of work. We know the research. That has translated into advocacy efforts, and that has given us all of these laws. And that has led, perhaps that's the reason why, we're starting to see an uptick in survival rates over time, particularly for shockable rhythms. This is probably because of the hands-only CPR and that we got defibrillators out into the world. So the survival is kind of going up, but it's still pretty, really poor. At very best, your survival is around 30% from a shockable witnessed rhythm. In other places like Scandinavia, these people have closer 40, 45% survival. So we haven't really caught up to this. Now, I will take a step back and say they're dead still. So any survival is still good and impressive, but we can do better than what we're doing right now. So when it comes to surviving cardiac arrest, we have the science. We know what to do. The problem is an implementation. We've started, started to focus on teaching the public because we need to mobilize this army of layperson rescuers. And we really need a lot of advocacy efforts to get these laws passed. So what are we going to do next? I've shown you the work that we've done to basically characterize where we're at, how current um, CPR is being trained currently in this country. But we think that we can do better. So I believe that we don't ha yet have a gold standard for teaching the public CPR. And that is my life's work, is to develop and implement that gold standard. And because all these laws have been passed in high schools, the goal is to get these things implemented in high schools. So we're going to study it. I actually have, since doing all this work, uh, further developed our CPR training method. So I showed you about Alive in Five, this five-minute method. But there is a really cool development, this thing called Lifesaver, that I am going to show you next. So Lifesaver was developed by a filmmaker in the UK. And this filmmaker, let's see, where did I put it? So this filmmaker um, created the, these films, and actually not this one, but one of the other scenarios, Daisy Ridley, who's the star of the Star Wars films. This was her first acting, like real acting gig, so that's kind of fun. Uh, so he made these videos to try and make an interactive, more realistic scenario for CPR training. His goal was just to have something that you could watch on your laptop or on your, um, on your phone to teach people CPR. But I think a combination of this very exciting video, which I'll show you, that's interactive, plus my five-minute hands-on method is probably the best way to train people. Remember I talked to you about that multi-sensory training where we wanted to engage people visually, auditory, and also um, with their tactile skills? This video adds another level of heightening the emotion and making it relevant. So this version I'm going to show you is UK. We're going to work together to make a Kentucky special, which I'll tell you about. But I want to show you this interact. Now, this is interactive. So when they ask a question, I need people in the audience to shout out your answer because I'll answer it for you. <clears throat> this, I think, is really exciting. I know we all laughed. Uh, but that's because you're experts who know how to do CPR. And if you've never seen CPR before, you don't know what to do. Oh, whoa. Still ticking. Okay. Quickly, please. Nope. <laughs> okay, thank you. We're going to be done with that. So if you go through that whole scenario, um, basically uh, Jake will survive and the paramedics will arrive and then you feel like a hero. So um, he's made two different versions of this, my collaborator. One is like this. The other is actually a virtual reality that's in the in a headset. And so the, you're in the um, role of the rescuer, and you can look around you and really get fully immersed. So he's done some cool data looking at heart rate when people do this. And if you have heart rate with just a regular CPR class, it's just normal. But when people are watching this and responding, their heart rate goes up, they're feeling more stressed, and that's actually good for learning. So what we want to do is make a combination of my Alive in Five method, but employ a video. It will be modified so that it's hands-only CPR with the U.S. standard. 
And obviously, they're going to be speaking real American instead of British English. Because, you know, I'm imagining a 14-year-old high school freshman in Kentucky needs to be something that they can identify with. So we think by making a combined version, a slightly shorter video that's going to keep their attention span, the vision is that we create this video that they still have to make these choices to reinforce what they've learned about CPR. But then they're going to actually have to do the real CPR while watching the video. And what I want to do is make this like a video game competition where you have five Five students lined up in the front of the classroom with their mannequins. And so there's that competition between them, and everyone's yelling and go, go, go. And we see who's the best at doing CPR in the class. We can maybe even um, have this become something on social media where the high schools are competing with one another for how good of rescuers are they. So really trying to get at that teenage mentality, the teenage um, attention span, but still combine this good emotional method with that real hands-on tactile skill set. So that's what I'm working on right now, hoping that I get the grant Dr. Bully mentioned in order to have the money to make this film. Also, if anyone in here wants to star in the film for free, please let me know. The victim is the hardest person because you saw his chest moving. They actually have to do that themselves and time that to 100 per minute, which is actually pretty difficult to do. Um, so we're really excited about this possibility, and we want to study this head-to-head -head with a normal CPR training that you would get in high school, like the Start the Heart I told you about, where they learn CPR and that's still good, but I think this will be better. And if we can create something that is free and easy to access for these high schools around the country, I think we're going to be able to improve that CPR skill retention rate. So in our study, we're going to go back into the high schools at the end of the year and see how well they've um, retained the skill set and compare the two different methods. The other thing that we really need to know is if this legislation that we've spent so much time and effort passing, if this actually translates into improved rates of survival from cardiac arrest. And that will take time, of course, to translate. So I just want to take a minute to thank all of the people who have made this possible. It really was a group effort. Uh, I think, again, for uh, maybe students or residents in the room who have a project they want to do and have no money, don't let that stop you. I just beg, borrow, and not steal, but beg and borrow to have people support this work. And we've been able to do some really cool stuff, and we've been fortunate to have it published in some high-impact places. Um, this is something that matters, and I think it makes sense to all of us. So we're going after low-hanging fruit, and I have a lot of people who are helping with it. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much. Um, probably, uh, Dr. Bowley mentioned a lot of accomplishments, but probably one of the biggest accomplishments is to make CPR come alive. No pun intended. I like no that. pun intended. <laughs> Let me start with the first question, uh, and you alluded to this. Actually, CPR is hard. You know, I know when I was doing my last CPR training, the instructor kept looking at me and going, <laughs> do it harder. So um, of the uh, people in the United States that you want to train, what percentage of them do you think actually are physically capable of delivering good CPR? Yeah, that's a great question. Yesterday, uh, I was talking to the residents about the obesity epidemic and how if you include overweight or obese, we're at 70 to 80 percent of the country are obese or overweight. So this is a really hard skill. And just from what I saw at the state fair, I mean, maybe 20 percent of those people could have kept it up for a full two minutes, let alone the 8 to 15, which is our average ambulance response times in a city. If you go out of the city into the county, those response times can be even longer, 15, 20 minutes. So I think that um, we're never going to reach the point where our population is providing high-quality CPR for the duration until the paramedics arrive. That said, something is still better than nothing. So that's why we're so keen on just training them to do anything is better than nothing. But the high-quality CPR, even healthcare providers, we are not hitting that mark ourselves. <laughs> we really aren't. Okay. Questions? Henry? Uh, thank you all for your presentation. Um, I'm thinking about different ways we could explore maybe getting some more people certified. And I'm wondering, could you go to a national... Um, company that makes a lot of money, like, for example, Starbucks, and ask them to partner with the local, our local American Heart Association, with some money to give out three $10 cards, for example, if we tried to get all of the University of Louisville undergraduates to give us a few hundred dollars. I'm just wondering if the combination, and if we could use some of the local money that we raise every year for the American Heart Association to actually stay here in town, because your cause, I don't know of any that's <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to come be my uh, spokesperson when I try to get money? <laughs> so for those at the VA, Henry's asking... Okay, good. <laughs> Henry's asking about really motivation. How can we motivate 
people to get CPR trained? And can we leverage something that everyone likes, like a $10 Starbucks gift card, to make this more appealing? I'm thinking a lot of things along those lines and open to all creative suggestions. But I do think this is an area where partnerships with large companies, organizations, and it's easy for them to let their employees get trained in a day, for example. So I think what my responsibility is, is to come up with a better method of training that's interesting and engaging and efficient. And then we can try to collaborate with people, organizations, to get this done on a widespread, a wide scale. Other questions? Yes. So that was, that was really fun, Laurel. And I, I really like how you combine kind of this community uh, service with research. It was very neatly done and, and creative. I wanted to know what you think about how the opioid epidemic is changing the landscape mm. of CPR and if, if we're, if there's no, no adjustment needed. It's a great question, especially relevant to here. So for those at the VA, Andrew's question is about the opioid epidemic and how that's changing the landscape of CPR. Certainly everyone in this audience who works in this hospital knows that a lot of our cardiac arrests or found down patients have now become because of opioid overdoses as opposed to because of massive MI that leads to VF arrest. I think we're just on the tip of understanding that and we don't have the epidemiologic data yet to tell us what shift there is, first of all, in etiology of arrest because I think over the next many years we're going to see at least in pockets of the country that our number of PEA or asystole arrests, our percentage goes up. Unfortunately, that's still the majority of arrests are asystole and PEA. VF and VT is down probably because we've done such a good job with our prevention measures. Um, so I think that's going to potentially confound and drive down our survival rates. But then speaking to how that changes how we train the public, I can mostly speak to how EMS is affected, emergency medical services. Narcan is just the first thing that anyone does at all when someone is found down because of this opioid epidemic. In fact, in our own response here in the hospital, we've recently changed our policy so that the, um, the team that goes from the ER to like, let's say you have a patient family member in the bathroom and they're found down. So we send a team from the ER up to, to grab them. They now can carry and administer Narcan even without a physician present because of this exact reason. When it comes to the, the lay public, um, I think I'm, I'm still focusing on training them in high quality CPR because whether or not they're down because of opioid overdose and their PEA versus VT, the CPR is still going to be effective. Um, so I don't know what the epidemiology is going to show. There are young people that are having this happen a lot of the time, so maybe the survival won't be impacted, um, but I'll leave that to others to do fancy models to figure that out. Love it. Um, I go back to my question. You teach a kid, a 16 year old, to get up for one day, right? Yes. Okay, so how many years does it keep or should it be managed? I mean, I'm about 10 years later. Yeah. <laughs> she needs to be retrained every 10 years or so. How long does the training last? The question is about uh, frequency of training and what's the duration of skill. Um, you are hitting a very important question that we don't know even for healthcare providers. So everyone has to get recertified every two years, as you know, in ACLS. That is totally made up. So the people on the resuscitation council at the AHA literally sat in a room and said, eh, that seems reasonable, maybe not too burdensome, but not so infrequent that you forget. But if you actually take healthcare providers, train them in CPR in one room, have them walk across the hallway into the next room and do CPR, the study was done, only 70% of them are going to do CPR correctly. So we don't actually know the answer to how long can you um, remember CPR, and I guess more importantly from a policy perspective, how frequently should we train them? So in the study that we have proposed, we have a nested sub-study where we have one of three refreshers that we would do in the middle of the school year. Refresher number one is no refresher. Number two is you just watch a brief video to remind you. And number three is that you actually practice again. And we're going to see if there's any difference between those. Now, that's still a short time frame. That's a refresher, you know, four months into a school year. But the bigger question we don't know, so I want someone to give me money to study it. Okay, yes. Uh, I really enjoyed that talk, mainly <laughs> because of the timing. Timing is. I'm a researcher in the department. I've never been trained in CPR and still had a chance with that last Saturday. <laughs> I found I was able to answer all of your questions in the interactive video, including the ones that you said, oh, those are the UK standards. Well, obviously, I was trained on Saturday in the UK standards. Okay. Is that going to be a problem? I mean, it's a... Right. 
So um, this is another big question that uh, at the policy level we've been asking. So the question is about um, how, how people are trained in the U.S. and that sometimes they're trained in hands only and sometimes they're trained for rescue breathing. So um, there's a difference between when we train people for BLS, basic life support, ACLS, advanced cardiac life support, versus just hands-only bystander CPR. So for anyone who's, who is functioning in a healthcare capacity, usually for people like sports coaches, uh, bus drivers, policemen, they're going to get BLS, and they're often going to be taught about rescue breathing because they're considered a, quote, professional rescuer. When we look at the study between rescue breathing versus no rescue breathing in the lay public, there was no difference in providing hands-only CPR versus rescue breaths. That study is what prompted us to say simpler, easier, and no one's afraid of germs if we do hands-only CPR, so the public should be trained that way. When it comes to healthcare providers, there's still a debate because probably there's actually even a debate about whether we do intermittent 30 to 2, uh, 30 chest compressions to 2 rescue breaths, or whether we do continuous, just give them six breaths a minute if you have a, a bag mask. So we don't really know the answer to that question. But when it comes to the lay public, there's no question that we are going to train in hands only CPR. That's the best way, the most efficient way. So that's what I'm focusing on for high schoolers. And I guess that answer is that our skill retention set is at least five days. At least five days. <laughs> but we didn't make you do CPR, so that's what would matter most. All right. Well, thank you very much. Wonderful talk. Thank you.